Welcome to Seattle Rotary. I'm Cindy Runger, president of this club. And for those of you who are new to Rotary, there are 1.2 million of us around the world dedicated to a life of leadership and service. And Seattle Rotary, being one of the largest Rotary clubs in the world, is a place where we can find world-class speakers, network with a great community, and also make an impact locally and also globally. So please be seated for past president Bill Center with the inspiration. Thank you, President Cindy. I was just thinking it's too bad we don't have Ray Charles still around to record a version of that. So today is Committee Fair Day. You might have noticed your inspiration committee doesn't have a table out there, but we're always on the lookout for fresh, inspiring voices. If you're inspired to join us, just call me, text me, email me, or tap me on the shoulder. Your fellow Rotarians would love to be inspired by you. And I don't have a table, but I do have a pocket full of candy, and I'll be hanging around out there after the meeting, so hopefully I'll see a couple of you. Reflecting on today's speaker, I pondered the question of who do I trust and why do I trust them? I trust my family. I've been blessed with a trustworthy family. That trust built on bonds of love and strengthened through adversity, has stood the test of time. I trust my friends, my shipmates, and my fellow Rotarians. They've earned that trust by weathering storms and demonstrating through the years true integrity and fidelity. And I've learned to trust myself by weathering my own storms and withstanding my own integrity and fidelity challenges through those same years. Finally, I trust our Creator. My faith has been tested, and I've learned over and over again that my life simply works better when I place my faith in Him, in my family, in my friends, and in myself. Please join me in a moment of prayer. We thank you, God, for the gift of faith, which makes it possible for us to place our trust in you and in those you send to help us along the way. Amen. Okay, and now to introduce the main program is Lisa Mayfield. Now, Lisa reminded me that I can take credit for her, this amazing person joining Rotary, and I will definitely take credit for it because she's the perfect example of a person with leadership DNA and the service soul. So Lisa and I met 15 years ago when we were both launching our um, new businesses. I left law and began a journey in finance, and she began her now very successful and influential aging wisdom. She's built a stellar reputation as a leader in her industry and now she's been elected as a 2019 president of her professional association, Aging Life Care Association. Uh, please welcome the coolest and funniest person I know, Lisa Mayfield. <laughs> I don't know where she got that. Um, so trust is defined by Webster's Dictionary as assured reliance on the character, ability, or strength of someone or something, one in which confidence is placed, dependence on something future or contingent, hope. No matter what kind of work or volunteer activities you do, trust is at the foundation. Earning trust takes time and is often a gradual process. Losing trust, however, often happens much more quickly. Today our presentation will explore the 2018 Edelman Trust Barometer, which is a global measure of trust in our government, business, and media, and the impact these results have on our lives here in Seattle. Our speaker, Will Ludlum, leads Edelman's Pacific Northwest region, which includes offices in Seattle and Portland, and more than 250 communications marketing professionals. Will came to us through our member, Jan Levy, who served with Will on the Seattle Center Advisory Commission, where he still serves. At Edelman, Will works closely with clients to identify innovative and strategic ways to break through tough communication challenges from brand differentiation to public health activation. 
Prior to joining Edelman, Will managed the Northwest offices for Hill, Hill and Knowlton and worked over a decade with Porter Novelli, building their global network and the responsibility of the firm's Asian Pacific region, where he helped clients successfully understand and influence key markets like China and India. Over the past 25 years, you don't look old enough for the 25 years, Will has worked with countless local, regional, and global clients. His background includes a strong foundation in corporate and technology PR, providing strategic counsel and crisis communication support to blue chip companies like Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Safeco, iTron, Starbucks, and Seattle Children's Hospital. Will is a WSU grad, for all the cougars out there, <laughs> serves on the advisory board for their Edward R. Murrow College of Communications, is a member of the Seattle Chamber's Community Development Roundtable, and is a trustee at Intamin Theater. So please help me give a warm rotary welcome to Will. Good afternoon. Boy, I have to start by just saying, as somebody that spent my entire career in public relations, how humbling and inspiring to hear uh, about Don's career and the impact that he's had on the Pacific Northwest. So I was just, uh, I feel privileged to be a, a part of a day that gets to celebrate somebody uh, as meaningful as that. Uh, I don't have wine to auction. I don't play the banjo, uh, but I do have data. So we'll, we'll start there. And uh, let me start by saying that we're in a unique position that uh, the genesis for the Edelman Trust Barometer actually dates back to the WTO riots uh, that happened in Seattle. And Richard Edelman uh, was looking at the disconnect that seemed to be happening between the various institutions uh, and, and clearly a lack of understanding and a lack of trust. And that was the, uh, really the inspiration and the idea behind looking at trust as a, as a, as a measurement tool. And now we have 18 years of, of data to look back on. And I'll say he was deliberate in looking at trust versus reputation because reputation is looking backwards. And trust is how I think you're going to behave in the future based on how you've behaved in the in the past so it was a very uh, specific and, and deliberate move uh, real quick I'll give you just some parameters behind the uh, if I can get the slide to advance uh, as I said we're in our 18th year the data that you're going to see is going to look at both the general public and the informed public uh, you should also know that we now uh, this this data set uh, represents uh, roughly 15% of the popu population globally. So statistically very uh, significant, and I'll point out some points of changes that we've seen over the past several years. Uh, the data went out in the field in November, uh, so we'll, we'll just, post-election, we'll be looking at doing the data set again. And I say that because there were some significant events. If you look at uh, uh, what happened with Cambridge Analytica and some of the uh, criticism that has come out over social media and transparency around privacy and, and data, uh, one can only uh, imagine what the trust data is going to look like this, this next year. So a quick trip down the memory lane of, of uh, a trust. Uh, I won't cover each point, but you know we saw the fall of the celebrity CEO back in 2002. We saw trust in uh, a person like me start to rise with social media in 2005. And so you see this ebb and flow of trust in who we trust as far as institutions varying throughout uh, the last several years. Uh, this last year, we really saw what we called a trust in crisis. And I kind of like to refer to it, I, I gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago and I said, you know, last year felt like the, the first season of Lost. The plane has crashed. This feels like season two. Plane still crashed, it's not, it's, you know, th there are still some, some dark statistics to look at, but we're starting to see tribes form, we're starting to see that there are opportunities and, and advancements that can be made if we, if we pay attention and we look at the markers. And that's really what I'd like to, to focus on today, it's how can we have an impact uh, within our community based on the data that we have in front of us. I'll start with, uh, I'm gonna start at the bottom and we'll work our way out. I'm gonna, I'll start with, uh, with the fact that we saw no recovery uh, this past year in the four institutions. And we look at uh, 
Government, NGOs, media, and business as the four pillar institutions that we look at. And what you'll see in the data this year is that we saw no rise in, in the four pillars. If you look at the uh, general, public, general public, all four institutions are well, you know, around or below 50%. And if you look at the informed public, we actually see that this is the first time that business now is equal with NGOs as far as the level of trust, a little bit above 50%. And that's going to come to play in a little bit later when I talk about the role that you have as business leaders and really having an impact and not sitting on the sidelines and waiting for government or NGOs to take the lead role and really moving beyond your responsibility to sell a product but to actually activate and be active in your, in your community. Uh, but let's set the stage for what has happened in the U.S. this, this last year. Um, If we look at the general population, you'll see that uh, in 2007, the U.S. was roughly in, in the neutral zone, and we dropped uh, approximately nine points, negative points, to be now in the middle of the distrusted pack. So clearly the U.S. as a, as, as a, as a, a country has really lost the trust of, of its citizens, and we've seen a, a major decline. Uh, you'll also notice there that China rose to the position of number one trust, and that's citizens within that company, or excuse me, that country and, and the, where they place their level of trust. If we look at that informed public, and informed public for us are people that have a higher education, higher income, and they consume media on a regular basis. The uh, informed uh, public, the U.S. dropped from trusting at roughly 68 percent to the, uh, the very bottom. Largest drop that we've seen in the 18 years of doing trust. The U.S. dropped, uh, dropped 23 uh, points in one year with the informed public, which is really profound. It really speaks to some of the, the major dynamics that we're seeing taking place in, uh, in the U.S. right now. With this, one of the things that we saw is that people are really starting to search for truth. What is truth and what, what can, where can they find and understand what is truthful in the community? And I'm going to share some data points around uh, discerning between fact and, and you know, fake, fake news. Uh, related to that, and, and this really symbolizes that I think people are really coming to grips with some of the, the, the issue of, of fake news and fake platforms. For the first time, we saw a jump in journalism. Uh, journalism went up five points on the trust index while platforms dropped. And the subtlety there is think of platforms as far as Facebook, Google, it's the platforms that you use to get information and journalism is the source of the information. And what we're seeing is that there's, there's a growing understanding of the importance of good journalism and good information and there's growing skepticism around data sources and where am I getting my information, which is, which is really rather, rather profound. This year we added some questions specifically around understanding whether or not the phenomenon of fake news and news, uh, fake news being used as a weapon uh, was a U.S. phenomenon and what we actually saw was that seven in ten uh, around the world uh, we're worried about false news and information uh, impacting uh, elections and being used as, as a weapon. So clearly not something that's confined to the U.S., but this is a, a global concern. If you think of some of the new uh, data privacy uh, restrictions that have been put in the U EU, it's, it's clear that, that uh, governments are starting to pay attention and, and know that we need to, need to change. Uh, there's also uncertainty over, people are confused about what's real and what's fake. 63% uh, said that the, they think that the average person doesn't know uh, to tell good journalism from rumor or falsehoods. And 59% said that it's becoming harder to tell if a piece of news was produced by a respected news organization. So there's really confusion in the marketplace over what is good information versus bad information. It'll get better, I promise. <laughs> the impact of that is what we're seeing is that more and more people are disengaging from uh, news and news media. 
This year, over 50% said that they were disengaged, meaning that they're not consuming news on uh, more than a, a weekly basis. So they're, they're going a week without consuming news information. Only 25% said that they're engaging on a, on a more frequent basis. And only 25% said they're actively consuming news and they're amplifying news, news and sharing it with others. Uh, this loss has impacted the, the, the lack of confidence in media in determining uh, trust and truth. 59% said, I am not sure what is true and what is not true. 56% said, uh, there's a loss in, in government leaders. I do not know which politicians I can trust. And 42 said that they don't know which companies or brands they can trust. So you can see that there's a general malaise around uh, forming trust in institutions uh, in general and, and frightening drops in specific areas. Now, I mentioned earlier, this is the, one of the first times that businesses trusted more than, uh, trusted equal with NGOs. What's really interesting too is that we saw a, a drop in NGOs and rather relative stable in trust in business. And if you look at the tr drop in trust in government, uh, well below 50%, both with uh, the general population and roughly 50% with informed. You as business leaders have an opportunity. There's an opportunity as the most trusted institution to play a role in the path forward and to be active and engaged. Uh, what we found is that trust within business is fragile, that uh, people have indicated that they um, Unless they see a company that they trust and they built trust with, only 63% said that they would use their product beyond uh, an initial engagement. Uh, what did they tell us is important for companies? They said, safeguard my privacy, uh, drive economic prosperity, invest in jobs. This isn't about quality of product. This isn't about selling a product at a, at a fair price. Those are table stakes. The things that they've raised are important for building trust are around how you show up for your employees, how you engage the community around you. Are you creating opportunity for others? Are you engaged in your, your community and representing your employees well? So remember that because I, I think business now has a, a, a major opportunity to actively engage within the community. The other big shift that we saw this year that's, that's really significant uh, we had seen a trend for three or four years that there was a rise in a person like me or a coworker as the mo one of the one of the most trusted sources of information, and we speculated that that was because of the rise of social media. I could talk to somebody that was like me. I could talk to uh, friends of mine, and I could form my opinion based on that information. With some of the, I would say, uprising of fake news and bad information through those social channels, we saw a huge drop. We saw a six-point drop in trust in a person like me, and we saw a, trust, uh, a, a drop in an employee as, as a source of information. At the same time, we saw something that we hadn't seen in several years, which is a rise in a te technical expert up by three points, a, a rise in uh, getting information from a CEO. We now have an opportunity to go back and provide credible sources of information for people as they've seen a decline in trust in, in those peers or peer sets. And that's a new trend. That's, that's something that's bucking what we had seen uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, but there's a mandate for those CEOs. 64% that they want uh, CEOs, they, they want CEOs to take a lead and take charge rather than waiting for government to Im impose a change. And if you look at the trust builders with a CEO, they said, what's, what's the expectation? Uh, that th their products and services are of high quality. That was below uh, forming trust. Uh, business decisions reflect the company values, was below establishing trust. So trust was the top driver uh, expectation uh, of CEOs in an organization. I've, uh, I've got a quote from Mark Benioff here where he said, today CEOs need to stand up and not just for their stakeholders, but for their employees, their customers, their partners, the community, the environment, schools, Everybody. What's interesting about this quote is it could have been said by Howard, Howard Schultz, 
We have very purpose-driven CEOs that are based out of the Pacific Northwest, and I want to share a couple of examples where I think that that's having an impact. Uh, it also could have been said by our mayor. I, I've seen two presentations by the mayor within the last week where she has said, we can't do it alone. We need business to step up. We need you to be a partner. We need you to take action with us along the way. So not only do we have a license to lead, but there's an expectation that we will take that leadership position. Uh, the two examples that I want to use, REI, another local company in 2015, uh, went against what you would think would be common sense. Uh, and they said, you know what? Employees have approached us. They hate being open on Black Friday. Why is Black Friday important to retail? It's, it's the day that you go in the black for the year. It's a very significant business day for most retailers. And they said, you know what? That's against our values. We want our employees to spend Thanksgiving uh, with their family, not in the store, preparing it for the next day. And we want to encourage our, our members to uh, go outside, not be sitting at a computer or sitting in a, in a store. Now, that was a real risk, and that was a business saying that we're going to stand for something that represents the values of, of who our members are and who our employees are. Uh, what was the impact? Well, they actually they, they saw 170 other organizations step up that year. They had over 100, excuse me, 1.4 million people pledged to opt outside. They saw a spike which they had not seen in years in membership, something that they had been struggling with as an organization. They struck a chord that was beyond trying to sell outdoor gear and really resonated with the values of, of the community in which they were a part. So I think a tremendous example of a, a business organization stepping up. And full disclosure, they're a client as, as, as well. Uh, the other one is more recent and, and arguably a little more controversial. Another Northwest com company, Nike, when they stepped out a couple of weeks ago and celebrating the anniversary of Just Do It, used Colin Kaepernick as somebody standing up for uh, an understanding that, that uh, our African and uh, American uh, community members don't feel that they're, they're met with law enforcement in, in an equal way. And I'm, I'm not here to, uh, to, to pick a side one way or another on the, on the whole kneeling controversy about the NFL, but here is a company, and if you read any of the, the coverage, there were a couple of really good stories in the Wall Street Journal that talked about they had been, you know, th their sales had been down for three to four quarters. Uh, Adidas had been really just kicking them, and they had become less relevant, and yet 44% of the uh, folks that bought Nike gear in the last, I think, last year uh, were within the demographic of 18 to 35. Nike took a bet on the values of the millennials that they think will be their customers for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And uh, you know, who's to say how it will impact? It's, it's, it's interesting. They saw a spike in, in uh, protests or you know, boycotting Nike, and that within three or four days had, had gone down. But arguably, they've, they sought specifically to seek out a, a population that they thought was important to their future and made sure that they were aligned with the values of the organization. So not only does a company, uh, not only should a company feel empowered, but I also think it's important to understand that your employees still are one of your most valuable uh, assets, and it's really important that you engage them. Uh, when we asked who is trusted more, CEO or employees, 71% said that they would trust an employee more than a CEO. So clearly, how you communicate to your employee base plays a major role in how you're going to be perceived as trusting as an organization. Uh, but what's interesting is there's, there's a bigger caveat. They, they expect more from employees. Um, they also said that they expect employees to speak up. 82% said that they expect, to, they expect them to speak up if the company is doing something wrong. So you better be transparent with those employees. 80% said that they support the company's causes. They expect the, uh, that the employees will support the company's causes. And 61% 61 said, 61 said that they expect uh, employees to pressure management to do the right thing. So not only Will they listen to the employees, but they have high expectations on how they're going to engage and impact uh, the success and forward movement of an organization. Um, I'll close real quick with what are some of the activities that you can do to activate your, your communities. Number one is define who you are. I mentioned REI. 
REI listened to their employees and they aligned with the values of, of their members. And, you know, it paid dividends. I guess that's, that's a pun. Uh, <laughs> But, but they also were true to themselves. And I think, you know, we often have clients that come to us and they, and they you know, I need to stand up for something and they want to stand up for the first thing that they hear. It's really important that you take the time. You can step in it if, if you're not deliberate and really assessing what your customers want, what your employees want, but make sure that you align with those individuals so that you can be truthful. And that expectation will extend beyond the product that you sell. Educate and advocate, you have an opportunity. With today's communication tools, you have a chance to speak directly to your constituents in a meaningful way. Uh, come to them with something that's relevant and meaning meaningful uh, that, and meets them w with the values that they, they share with you. Activate allies. If I look at some of the issues that we potentially face right now as far as tariffs and the impact on the Pacific Northwest and some of the commodities that are important to us and manufacturing and software sales, it's really important that you look to your fellow business leaders to really uh, align and activate those that are around you. And then finally, create connections. And I can't think of a better organization that's doing that within our community. Uh, it's exciting to see the, the breadth of folks that are gathered here today. Those connections will help the role that I know that, that the mayor is asking us all to do, which is it's time for business to step up. I think we've got some great examples that happened within this last week with uh, Jeff Bezos stepping, stepping up with a multi-billion dollar uh, check to uh, focus on homelessness. And if you saw the front page of the, the Seattle Times today, I think uh, Paul Allen stepping up to really create housing is an example of it's not government's responsibility, it's all of our responsibility to, to, to step up. And at the end of the day, we think that those are what represent the truth drivers. That's what's going to build uh, uh, a level of, of trust within your constituents. And uh, at the same time, it's good for business. And we also think that it's, it's good for the community. So um, I have to say, I am more optimistic uh, now than I, I was a year ago. And I will say by some of the interactions that I've had with business leaders just within the last two to three weeks as we've all come back from the summer break, uh, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that we live in a community where people want to engage and they want to build trust and we want to solve some of the big hairy challenges that we face as a community. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you have about the Edelman Trust Bureau for 2018. Oh, we have yes, a question right, right here. Front. Hello, thank you so much for such an amazing presentation. It's very informative. A Sorry. little depressing at times, I, but very I informative. Um, I was kind of perplexed by something in one of the graphs where it said that there was such a significant drop in trust for people who are like yourself. I find that really counterintuitive. Can you explain that a little bit? Thank we, you. We, we did too, but I think it's aligned with some of the if you also saw that drop in platforms, and those platforms are, you know, it's Google, it's your online platforms that you, you engage with, uh, th there was a huge hit. And what's interesting, I was sharing earlier before lunch, um, this data set was out before Cambridge Analytica became an issue, and people felt that their information had been manipulated and that they uh, weren't receiving real information. Our belief is that a drop in a person like myself is the fact that a lot of the information currency that was shared through social media channels this past year, people are starting to question. Is it, is it real? Can I trust it? And all of a sudden, you're seeing this swing. You saw that rise in journalism. People are realizing, I think, that they, they need to go to trusted sources more, which I, I find encouraging. I, 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 you know, it, there would be nothing better, I think, than if we had uh, an informed electorate um, as we go to the polls this November. Hello, I'm David Brenner. I'm uh, very heartened by the percentage on journalism. I think that's really important, too. I have two questions, one methodological and one substantive. The methodology question, if I read your first slide about informed public correctly, uh, it, one of the factors is age 25 to 64. I'm 63. <laughs> so I'm wondering what, why that choice. Is it the workplace, the idea? My substantive question is, does the, uh, do you think that the increased trust in business is coming at the expense of trust in government? And is that uh, a problem for our democracy? I will, so to your first question, 
I, I should have started by, I'm not a data scientist, and I know that we have you know, smart folks that, that I, I'm sure they had a reason that they did that. And you know, part of having a body of 18 years, I, whatever parameter they decided 18 years ago was gonna be important, we've carried through. So I, I honestly, I don't know. I can, I, if you give me your card after, I'm, I'm happy to, to look into it. As far as the, the rise in, in business, um, I, the greater fall has been the, the crisis in government. And what's interesting is if you look back, uh, the trust in business dropped uh, in Japan around the time of Fukushima after they had the tsunami. So we, there, there are gauges throughout the history of the trust barometer where we can see where uh, the, the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 resulted in an increase in trust in government and a uh, decrease in business. So there was, a fel there was a general sense that there needed to be more government oversight. So I don't, th I, it, I don't think one comes, and this isn't based on the data, this is my interpretation of the data, I don't think one has come at the co cost of the other. I think we had a, a moment of true crisis in, in trust in, uh, in government uh, based on a lot of rhetoric at the time we saw a breakdown in, in truth uh, through our social media platforms. It was a bit of a, a perfect storm. Um, at the same time, I think there's an expectation that if we, if we've hit a pocket of turbulence, people are looking at the pilot, and I think that the, the pilot right now uh, tends to be business leaders. And it's, you better do something, since we, you, you do have more trust. And I think that's what we've been advising uh, clients. There are a lot of areas where I don't think business is stepping up fast enough. I think data and privacy in this country, uh, if the technology, and we, we actually saw, I didn't share it today, but we saw a drop in, uh, technology's always been the highest trusted sector, and we've seen a de decline over the last couple of years. And arguably, I think, self-driving cars, AI, big data. There are some hairy things that the technology industry needs to get in front of. And if they wait until uh, the government does, I, I think that's going to be too late. I think we've seen with some of the hearings with some of the social platforms in front of Congress is, is telling you that business isn't stepping up to lead. Here we have a question to your right from our past president, Mark Wright. Well, hi, Mark Wright with King 5 News. I look forward to the trust barometer every year. Um, as you know, this is probably the most challenging time in the history of our country. For journalism, we have a president calling actual journalism fake news. I'm encouraged to see the increase in trust in journalism. What, what's your advice to traditional media today? How do we continue to rebuild the trust in our customer base? Boy, we were just having a, <laughs> a conversation about this as far as um, you can't convey true thinking in a tweet. And I, I think the more that we can help people, the more that we can help people to understand the importance of long form journalism to really develop thought is, is critical. I, sadly, I don't have, I mean, right now we have uh, politicians that are using their direct channel through Twitter to 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 your point to 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 really downplay true quality journalism and calling it fake news uh, at the at the same time uh, you know putting whatever comments uh, he wants to in that format and and I think the the data from what I can tell, is moving in the direction that people are starting to understand that, that that's not reliable. And those links that are tied to Twitter or through Facebook or other social media channels are to be questioned. So I guess the good news in my mind is the data is telling us that people are starting to figure it out. Uh, so uh, you know, as most things, uh, I think self-correction is probably the most powerful. So. You know, I, I hope, and after some of the things that we've seen that have happened since the data set went out in the field, I, I think we'll see a, a, an even further drop in trust in platforms. And I, you know, I certainly hope that we see an increase in trust in journalism and in uh, the value of, of you know, investigative reporting. One more. Not all media is created equal. Um, 
How, does, how do your statistics deal with the level of trust in, say, Fox News versus CNN? We, so we don't, um, we ask the question in, in general so that people are left to interpret uh, what they see as, as, as media. Um, I will tell you, I didn't share it today, but we actually, we did a swipe of, of trust data uh, on people that had responded uh, more favorably to Hillary Clinton and Trump. And we've done that actually in the last two years. Uh, trust in media for Trump supporters was, you know, as to be expected, uh, very, very low. I, I, I forget off the top of my head, but I want to say like 16 to 18 uh, percent. The Clinton supporters, the trust in media was disproportionately much higher. So if you use that as a, 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 a lens to look at that data as far as trust in media, one could argue that, that you get a sub-slice of, of where people maybe are getting their information and what their their sense of value is uh, with those outlets. But we don't ask specifically about uh, specific publications. All right, thank you very much. Today's program is about trust. So in thinking about this, I found this, oh, you guys are ahead of me. All right, so I found this Arab proverb reminding us that, well, it's, very, you know, very good to trust and have faith in something. It does not let us off the hook. We have to take responsibility. So this is totally relatable. Trust in Allah, but tie your camel. Thanks, everybody. It's been fun. See you next week.